welcome, welcome, welcome to Dr. Stephen Porges. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. Looking forward to uh, having an interesting dialogue. Brilliant, lovely. And Mel, I think, is going to introduce you to anybody in the audience that doesn't know who you are. Um, Mel, do you want to take it away about Stephen and Absolutely. about his background? I would love to. So Stephen is a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University, where he is the founding director of the Traumatic Stress Research Consortium, professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina and professor emeritus at both the University of Illinois at Chicago and the University of Maryland. Stephen served as president of the Society for Psychophysiological Research and the Federation of Associations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences and is a former recipient of a National Institute of Mental Health Research Scientist Development Award. And most importantly, I feel in 1994, Stephen proposed the polyvagal theory as author of the polyvagal theory, the pocket guide to the polyvagal theory and co-editor of clinical applications of the polyvagal theory. Stephen has also now created the safe and sound protocol, which is a music based intervention, which is currently being used by more than 1400 therapists to improve spontaneous social engagement, reduce hearing sensitivity improve language processing and state regulation thank you amazing we shall be asking you about that if that's okay towards the end but I couldn't really start the interview without a personal question really of Mm. what got you into this field in the first place well the field is a complicated question because it can be it's all about personal narratives um I mean, we can go back to when I was a teenager, we can go back to yeah. when I was in grad school, or we can go back to uh, 1994. Uh, they all had, in a sense, different antecedent, let's use the word, it, uh, I have to apologize, but triggers or things that pushed us into a different direction. Uh, my curiosity was always about what was going on inside of people. I have to use this almost cliche comment that certainly language was not sufficient to interpret intentionality. And I was very uh, taken by that, that people would use words that seemed fine, but their body, their facial expressivity, their movements didn't quite click with my body. So this goes back to the child in me. Okay, so I had this kind of uh, journey of inquiry. Then I started to actually as a teenager, and I haven't talked very frequently about this, I I got interested in hypnosis. And what was I using Uh hypnosis for? I was trying to have people tell me what was behind their behaviors. So I was trying to quote, let me uh, use a a kind of a cliche, lift the lid on on their id, on their brain to try to get the evaluative part of their behavior off and let them kind of like, uh, uh, tell me what they were doing. And that I put to bed when I graduated from high school. It was a little bit, it wasn't going in the right directions. And so I was basically interested in in this whole notion of how is our body expressed in our presence and how do you measure that? It wasn't until I went to graduate school that I discovered that there was an emerging new area and that was psychophysiology. And that was all about using physiological measures to, in a sense, tap into psychological, mental, intentional states. Uh, But it was a correlational perspective. And my initial research was on that, was, in a sense, putting electrodes on, measuring basically heart rate patterns. And in doing that, in my graduate school years, I discovered a phenomenon. And that was heart rate variability. So I was actually there at the beginning and was measuring this uh, phenomenon of these oscillatory patterns in heart rate that change when people uh, attended and there were individual differences and people had more of this seemed to be better attenders, more resilient. And that led me on a journey to try to figure out what was the neural regulation of those patterns. And so I stopped in a way being a classical psychophysiologist into becoming a neurophysiologist where I was trying to look at the neural patterns that upon which uh, mental activity, cognitive activity, and behavior is superimposed. And polyvagal 
theory became the product of that journey. It was a journey about understanding that the physiological state that we're in really is a major determinant of how we react to the world. And talking to a world of trauma thrivers, I mean, if we want to discuss that, uh, what is really common, we should actually, we can even throw the word trauma out because what the experience is, is a destabilization of autonomic function. It's a felt experience. It's not an event. So polyvagal theory, when it starts discussing trauma, tries to get people away from articulating event and right. stop focusing on event, but really giving validity to the bodily feelings, and that's polyvagal. And once we understand what those bodily feelings represent neurophysiologically, we start getting this tremendous respect for what our body is attempting to do, and that's to protect us. Our top-down yeah. monitors, our narratives say, I can deal with that. Our bottom-up uh, nervous system says maybe not. And uh, that's, the that's the dialogue that is going on in people who have survived trauma. And as they go through therapy or let's use sort of transformation, the top-down narrative and the bottom-up feelings start becoming more integrated. And that's healing. But yeah. remember, our culture is a culture of separation of feeling and cognition. I mean, I'm, I'm talking well, to two people in London. So what yeah. I mean, I don't have to I don't have to tell that to them. It's your tradition. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. And also the tradition I was just thinking about, and I don't know, Mel, about how the mind and body were so separate yeah. until, yeah. you know, and well, treated yeah. differently. And we had models like, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy that didn't look at the physiology in the body. Well, again, Okay, I like to basically make this statement that I've learned more about being a human being from the trauma community than I ever learned before. And I walked into the trauma community relatively late. I was an established full professor for several decades. I was welcomed into the trauma community, not by my wisdom of trauma, but that my models explained the experiences of people who had trauma. And to me, I started to really learn what was going on. And it's really startling. So you ask really a basic question, where did the separation occurred? And we have to, in a sense, put on the table that religious beliefs had a lot to do with this. And okay. we go back to the concept of Cartesian dualism, Descartes, yeah. and where there's the separation between mental activities, brain activities, mental activities, and the body. And if you could make, uh, is, I mean, so if you want to study anatomy, you better get any concept of, uh, let's use the term soul, anything that, that religion thought it could hand, what owned, you better not talk about it because you'll end up being burnt at the stake. I mean, it just, it was a, a life-threatening situation. But the impact of this dualistic model still exists even in medical treatment today, yeah. regardless of what you may think about what physicians are taught. They are taught in a very limited way, very little information about even brain-body connection, let alone mental activity affecting bodily changes. Wow. So they are, I, I wouldn't say, I'm not, I don't want to blame physicians, but I want to blame their training. Their yeah. training if, is is not insightful. And yeah. we can start seeing the impact of all these, what are called medically unexplained symptoms, but they're clustering around people who have adversity history. So uh, the, and we'll get into this relatively quickly. And that is, what does adversity history do to your nervous system? It retunes it to yeah. be in physiological states that support defense. It doesn't support connection, co-regulation, calmness, it doesn't do the things that we like to think are human. And yeah. so we end up in a sense being in this protective mode in a, in, a, in a true sense, a brilliant strategy if you're under threat and a brilliant strategy if the threat is, ac is acute. But once yeah. the nervous system interprets the threat as chronic, we are all victims. Yeah. yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Mel, I think you were going to ask, weren't you, Stephen, about for those people that are listening that don't know what vagal means yeah. even, 
could we start with that premise, perhaps, and we're then going, you want to explain what the theory is? Yeah, we're going to kind of fold those two together. Yeah. And we're going to try to not talk about the Vegas, because that gets us into this material world. And also has, if, if the Vegas has such a role, let's manipulate the Vegas and then we'll be fine. But the Vegas is, in a sense, part of our entire uh, let's say it's a portal to our nervous system and expressing what our nervous system is attempting to do. And when we start using vagal stimulation and even breathing exercises and posture shifts, we are trying to send different information that may <clears throat> or may not be accepted. And that information is that we are safe. So yeah. we have to, in a sense, structure a little different type of story. And the story is really uh, whether you believe in evolution or not, we have a nervous system that is similar to other mammals, but very different from our ancestors who were asocial reptiles. Now, we would never pick up a couple of lizards and say, why aren't they social? You know, why <laughs> are, you know we wouldn't Good tickle point. them and because we acknowledge <laughs> that they're different. But if we have a human being whose physiology is in a sense in a reptilian state of defense, we expect them to override that and become social. And that's what cognitive behavioral strategies are. Override it with a top-down model. It can do some things, but it can't do others. So in a sense, we can't, through any level of intentionality, make a reptile social. It's just not wired into their nervous system. What happened in the transition from reptiles to mammals is this beautiful journey of a modification or what's called in evolutionary biology, a repurposing where the nervous system gets adjusted, uses some old parts, creates some new ones, but our autonomic nervous system got repurposed in which it was now able to calm us down, a new branch of the autonomic nervous system. This more, uh, it's called a more ventrally vagal, meaning in the brainstem, the nerve comes from an area that is ventral to where the original uh, dorsal vagus. Uh, dorsal is your is your back, ventral is your front. So if you slice your brain stem, you see that the word, the nerve vagus is actually coming, it's a collection of fibers coming from different places. So we don't really want to talk about the combined nerve. We want to talk about pathways. And so that ventral pathway is really part of the uh, phylogenetic, our evolutionary journey from an asocial reptile to a social mammal. And that is through this mechanism, this neural transition in which the inhib inhibition of our heart rate to calming us down, like you, know, you say, take a deep breath, exhale slowly. What are you saying? You want your body to calm down. You do that because exhalation allows that vagal pathway now to be effective on your heart's pacemaker. So yeah. the interesting part is that, that the area of the brainstem that regulates that calming uh, vagus is the area that controls the muscles of your face. And this is, Amazing. in a sense, if you want to link together this whole issue of trust and safety and a journey of connectedness, we do it through voice and face, but doing it through voice, face, and listening, which is also using muscles that are regulated in the same part of the brainstem, we are calming our bodies down. So if you yeah. chant, or if we talk together, or if you're noticing my voice got a little bit more melodic, and your body start to calm down when voices do that because they're wired to do that. They're wired to detect intonation, gesture, facial expressivity, uh, posture. And it's linked to this uh, ventral vagal circuit, which turns off our defenses. Now, that's good and that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> There's always an up and a downside, eh? <laughs> well, it's it's a sense it's good if we understand the responsibility of turning it on and the responsibility of turning it off. Now, thrivers of trauma understand that they were often their trauma was linked to, in a sense, having that inhibition on, having their safety on, thinking something was safe, and in a sense being tricked. And the violation of trust was so profound to their nervous system. It was the violation of trust that is the trauma. 
and it retuned the nervous system not to trust. Mm -hmm. So if we want to, it says, look at the array of expressions of trauma, even if it's medical trauma, or like in the US now, there's a hurricane and there's flooding. Yeah, it's, it's a dreadful. violation of our predictability of what our nervous system says, I'm safe in my home. And now uh, a tornado blows the roof off or a flood comes and my kids are in the basement and the water's rising. And people have died in on the East Coast of the US yeah. this week. Uh, yeah. So it, it's they're suffering, again, a violation of trust and the expectancy that everything will be okay. So the, the theory is really about this evolutionary journey of moving from asocial reptiles, which we would not expect to comfort each other or to, you know, if something happened to one reptile, we don't expect another to come over and give it a hug. Uh, we not don't expect I've it. Seen, no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so, so we have this whole understanding, but if our nervous system moves down that evolutionary ladder, and that's what polyvagal theory describes, it describes the evolutionary stages of the autonomic nervous system and says those stages are retracted when under threat or challenge. And that is dissolution or evolution in reverse. So evolution in reverse takes us from being a social mammal to being in a social reptile. And as therapists, when you have your clients coming in who want to be on the cognitive level, want to be social, connected, and they sit down in your, in your clinic and you talk to them and their body says, this isn't for me. I got to get out of here. Mm. And yeah. so that's now the body sending cues up to the brain and the brain saying, can't stay here, got to get out of here. And of course, what do we call this? We call this anxiety or pervade. We give it labels, labels, but it's a body reaction that the body is really telling us, broadcasting to us that we're in a state of threat. Yeah. So that is a massive part of it, isn't it? The hierarchy. Mm -hmm. But then there are other, there are two other organizing principles, I, I, I understand, which is probably a good thing for us to know as therapists, which is the co-regulation piece. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the co-regulation uh, concept from a therapeutic model is if you start using cues of safety, the nervous system has to welcome those. Yeah. And, and that is the co-regulation. And from a... Uh, an astute, talented therapist, they realize they can't go too quickly because the cues of safety will be uh, reflexively accepted. But when the body does this reactive or reflexive calming down, the feedback of the body being calm is now interpreted as vulnerability. And now the yeah. body goes into this, got to get out of here. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really remarkable to watch this in action uh, with and we tend to say, why are you anxious? You never ask a person why are they anxious, because it's not an event. Their body is detecting cues. I, I want to propose a different uh, kind of metaphor, and the metaphor is that, like the movie The Matrix, which we can think of that as kind of a metaphorical bit, but we want to say the cues that we are living through, the Matrix, are cues of threat. Yeah. Our whole culture it evolved to, in a sense, manipulate, control, whatever term we want to use, through cues of threat, whether it is school or medicine or is always about evaluation. Think about evaluation. Think about evaluation as not being threat. You can't. Evaluation is threat to our nervous system. So we have this neural uh sensitivity to evaluation, yet our society is, is evaluative virtually all the time, whether it's work environment or other environments. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So would you say, Stephen, that those of us that have experienced trauma um, or have PTSD or complex PTSD, um, we are the ones that struggle with hmm. being in our ventral vagal system and coming into that, that window of tolerance yeah, but but you're already evaluating yourself or your mm -hmm. community. And in a sense, you can't start there because of the sensitivity to evaluation, which is a threat. So if you want to move the person along, it becomes 
is that this co-regulatory model, a shared journey of exploration. So the relationship with the client is to say, oh, I, you really want to get there. Let me help you get there. It's like uh, share the experience. How do you feel when those cues come? And what are those feelings telling you? So you're learning with them about who they are. You're not evaluating. And if we create cultures in which we respect the other, it changes drastically or dramatically is a better word than drastically. <laughs> the, uh, so the, the issue is we become more accessible. And the problem we have in our modern world, even in the modern therapeutic clinical world, certainly in the medical world, is that we're not good witnesses of our clients. We're not good witnesses of children, of our spouses or our friends. We immediately evaluate uh, what they're telling to us. And we might even say, oh, that didn't bother me. Why should it bother you? And that is, is that's the worst thing to do because you haven't listened to them and they want to be heard. They do not necessarily want you to fix what they've experienced. They want to, they want you to acknowledge that they have communicated their feelings to you. Yeah. And I think this is missing in the toolkit that we use for our social development. Yeah. Yeah, it's so much about being seen and being heard yeah. and that sense, isn't it, that when we're children, when we don't feel seen and heard or our feelings aren't acknowledged, you know, we lose that sense of identity and sense of self and start to shut down and, and all the rest of it. So that that is really, really vital. I, I, I hear you on that. Are there things that we can do as therapists or clinicians or for people who are in the group who aren't clinicians? Are there things that we can do with others other than giving them advice or not hearing them that makes them feel more safe or that they've got their social engagement system turned on, or how can we help? Well, you know, the, the trauma community tells us when we talk to them, in a sense, uh, some uh, survivors are more comfortable with their dogs yeah. than they are with other people. So what are they telling us? They're saying there are features of social engagement, of co-regulation, of cues of safety they get from their dog. They don't get from their spouse or their friends and that they feel that they can be who they are with their dog. And once a person walks into the room, their body shifts state, meaning that they feel evaluated. They, they feel that they aren't seen for who they are. Um, many uh, people who are survivors of trauma write books and they often contact me and it's all about uh, their lives as never being lives of themselves. It's some other uh, persona that they created that appeared to be successful. And that again, this, these uh, boundaries or barriers of being of the core coming out, but also the uh, way that we evaluate others as successful. It's not like saying, oh, the most successful people I've met have really been able to connect with others. That's not how we talk. We say, oh, they have this amount of resource. In my world, it's uh, publications and grants. Um, in other words, worlds, it's really, I, it, it's, everything gets down to a type of resource that is quantifiable. Yeah. And it's never about the persona the personal aspect of the person. Even words like if we say, oh, he's a or she's a very accessible person. What does that mean to many people in the profession? Oh, it should mean a lot. You know, yes. the, the, the authenticity that when I'm in the room with this person, I feel different. Those are the people that I call super co-regulators that you walk into a room and you know that yeah. they have something special. They make yeah. you feel is a disarmed, you're totally disarmed by their presence. And it, it, it's a remarkable, uh, it, the problem is that we, in a way, are all pseudoscientists. We think that things that emerge from our neurophysiology can be manipulated in everyone. Yeah. So we think we can quote fix, which is this mechanistic worldview, and even the worldview of let's say vagal stimulation, vagal this, vagal that, when we really want to say we want the system of the body to regulate itself in the most optimal way, and that requires vagal information going to the organs 
and back from the organs to the brain. And once the body is in this safe state, guess what happens to the brain? It can then really explore the world. Yeah, yeah. Out of interest, Stephen, do you think that the these super co-regulators is is this something that you you think can be learned or is it something that is just somebody that has well, it or they don't it's, it's an interesting question the first statement is it's not learned in the way that one would think skills or tasks would be taught yeah. so it's almost like uh, watching the movies of the karate kid i'm not sure you've watched those but where okay. he's never really taught karate he's taught all these other things but in a sense it's the same thing what do you have to what do you need to be taught you need to be taught not to evaluate, to be present. And as you do that, you become a listener, a witness of other. And when you when that arrives, then everything else in the body starts coming back and forth in your body. So yeah. it's not the product is co-regulation, but you really can't teach it being directed at it. And this is in a sense a very polyvagal type of interpretation. If I shift my physiological state, I have different emergent properties, mm -hmm. meaning that my behaviors, my thoughts, my actions, my interactions are different. If I shift it down to a more mobilized defensive one, face goes flat, voice loses prosody. Uh, everyone who would interact with me would say, why doesn't he like me? Yeah. I mean, that would be the response, you know. It's, and, so, it's and, so true. And then you have people who are vacant and it, within the world of survivors, it's not that uncommon. So you start interacting and suddenly their body says, I'm getting out of there and they, they're gone. They've dissociated. Mm -hmm. And what their mind is saying, I'm not getting injured. I'm not saying anything. I'm not moving because if I do, I'll do something wrong and I'll get injured. Mm -hmm. So their nervous system has this bias of negativity even if the intrusion into the nervous system is with great or let's say positive intention, the nervous system has already categorized it as hurtful. Yeah. Yeah. I find that I find today, interestingly enough, and I'm going to share with you that I wonder, Stephen, if you're a super regulator. No, 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 I, no, no. I, I, I did start the interview thinking, oh, crikey, it's it's, you know, it's Professor Porges. But yeah. your manner and your way and your face and your tone. I'm is not. I'm OK. Let me. About let me well, thank you, but um, but I use the term "good enough." <laughs> no, I'm not, yeah. you, you, yeah. Once you meet a super white, you say, you know, it's like really? it's like a virtuoso. I mean, I used Is to play it? the clarinet, but I don't play anymore. And, you know, it's like. <laughs> I'm sitting back in awe because I, I know what is going on in that person, how they're functioning. I, I think I do fine in sense the videos, the YouTubes and stuff are effective because of the gestures intonation. But I mean, you need to you need to be in the room with a with a world class one <laughs> to really, in a sense, have humility. So what I'm saying is um uh, okay, so Mel actually asked a question uh, that is kind of, what can we do in a therapeutic setting to facilitate that? And the first thing is they have to be quiet. Uh, uh, clinics have to be quiet. They can't have road noise, elevators, you know, mechanicals, because the body interprets noise, especially low frequency noise, as predators. Mm. So, and then you also have to ask the question, maybe a companion dog coming into a therapeutic session would be helpful. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, lovely. Remember when, before COVID, when, when therapies were face to face, you know, a different time, then, then this, the person coming into therapy had to leave their safe room, their home, get into a car or some other conveyance get to the clinic, walk up a flight of steps or interact with other people, which they may not be prepared for, and then sit in a room with a, hopefully someone they are now knowing their therapist, have their vulnerability really ripped out and pulled out in front of them, 
then they have to leave and go back into that world, drive home, and all these types of threats are being bombarded on them. So as they are becoming more accessible, they're becoming more vulnerable, and it's hard for them to deal with that. Now, what I think many, many therapists have learned is that in the world of trauma, telemed has been reasonably good. That people have, in a sense, uh, their yeah. clients have liked uh, is it's having therapy from their home, having more control, more agency. If they felt uncomfortable, they could turn the camera off. Yeah. If they didn't want to look at the therapist, they could turn turn that screen on. Basically, they had a level of control of the stimulation that potentially could overwhelm them. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. So what do you think the, how or how much do you think polyvagal theory has impacted the treatment of trauma and and how what do you think is different as a result of it i think that it's placed an emphasis on bodily feelings i think uh the intuitive therapists always knew this and the somatic therapists of course were in that realm but i think it gave a type of legitimacy because it had a neurophysiological uh, theory and it also had measurements so that it, people could now explain the feelings from both a neurophysiological one and also as an adaptive strategy. So it wasn't that it changed how many therapists saw things, it changed how they explained the things that they observed. Okay, yeah, I see that. I see that. Makes sense to me. So. For those people that are listening, maybe that don't have a therapist or don't have support, is there anything that they can do by themselves? Yeah. What I often like, first of all, they have to start, or maybe they already are, honoring their body. So in a sense, rather than getting angry at your body and saying, I have these feelings, they're getting in the way, you know, take time out, listen to the feelings kind of figure out what they're doing and kind of be comfortable or more comfortable with it. Um, And in a sense, again, the Western world strategy is if you have those feelings, let's take some drugs to get rid of those feelings. Mm -hmm. And what our body is saying is something is not being regulated correctly. And what that means is that the nerves that are going to our visceral organs are sending information, actually, usually the nerves that are coming from the visceral organs are saying, I got this reaction and my heart's palpitating, my gut hurts, or even I have migraines. And so you start getting, or irritable bowel syndrome, which is one of the frequent ones, or fibromyalgia. Our body is rebelling or inflammation. People start looking swollen, puffy, and the body's rebelling from being told to shut up is really what's happening. So what toolkit do they have? They have a toolkit to listen to their body and they have a toolkit uh, to breathe, to start listening to their body by exhaling slowly, which increases the endogenous vagal regulation of the heart. It calms us down. It's an online toolkit. Of course, yoga and yoga therapies knew this for you know hundreds of years it's not like it's new and chanting is another because it's exhalation and also stimulating oral motor part which is sending signals to that brainstem area of that ventral vagus that social vagus to calm us down so singing uh slow exhalations uh Dance movement therapies are where you have the face-to-face interaction with others, which calms us down, but you can't sit still, so you move. So it integrates the two of them into a pro-social co-regulatory system. So we're talking about two levels of co-regulation, person to person, but we're also talking about brain and head to body and visceral organ. And if we're talking about befriending and attending to the body and, and, and awareness and bringing perception to kind of what's going on in the body, how are you, uh, what are your thoughts about, for example, in EMDR, you know, mm-hmm. we're in the body and we're, we're on a belief and on a, an event and the body will want to shake or move or yeah. run or cry so it's almost like the body is the container and up yeah. comes the, mm-hmm. how do you feel about release work? A release well, what, I, the there's release and resolution. So if you yeah. don't allow it to release, release, 
the feedback will not allow it to resolve. I mean, somatic yeah. experiencing in the body, uh, somatic therapies have the same model. And even the safe and sound protocol, which is my acoustic one, has that model because sometimes the acoustic sounds, be, which are sounds of safety to a typical, a neurotypical individual will trigger anxiety and threat to a mm. person who has a trauma history. So it has to be, it says it's reacted to and resolved. The nervous system has to acknowledge it and realize, have this type of realization on a neural level that it's not hurt, hurtful. That's what the resolution is. Could you explain a bit more about safe and sound and what it well, actually Okay, so safe and sound uh, protocol uh, was initially designed when I was doing work with autistic kids because they had a series of, of symptoms which could be seen as auditory hypersensitivity, uh, a motor defensiveness, and autonomically they had very low ventral vagal tone. So they had my cluster. And when I developed the theory, I started to think about how can I trigger the system to move states? So I talk about dissolution, going degrading. How can we reverse it to go, in a sense, to its mammalian state, out of this more reptilian defensive state? And the model was really the maternal lullaby what a mother is doing to her infant, the crying infant. She's using intonation of voice. Uh, and the, the baby stops crying, calms down, and becomes safe. It's also the model that you use with your dogs. So if you talk to your dog, you don't talk loud in a low-pitched voice. It's a sing-songy, infantile type of, of, of speech. And that is wired into the nervous system. Those frequencies are selected as cues of safety. They evolved when mammals change or evolve from reptiles because what happened was they had little, their jaw bones, the little middle ear bones broke off the jaw bone and it gave them a frequency band to survive within the reptile world. In a sense, a, a frequency band of social communication. So the safe and sound protocol was designed to see what would happen if you presented a program of stimulation of within that frequency band. And to start with a model that's really said, uh, it doesn't matter what state those middle ear muscles are and that neural system is, we know the frequencies that will get into your brain. Right. And so it's like there's resonant frequencies that will get in. So we'll take that arrow band, we'll send it up to your cortex, your auditory cortex, and then we'll modulate it. And as by modulating, we're challenging it and if it works, the feedback should now start creating greater tension on those middle ear muscles. But those middle ear muscles are being regulated in the brain center that controls facial expression and vagal regulation of the heart. And sure enough, with many, I mean high percentages, uh, their social engagement system, the smiles, the uh, start coming on board. And then with autistic kids, I would start seeing them turn and hold my hand, look at me. And it was really very interesting to see this whole change of behavior that was really piggybacked on shifting physiological state. So what appeared to be a diagnostic feature was really the emergent property of being in a physiological state that supported defense. And if you could trigger that back into a more safe physiology, a welcoming physiologist came out. And when I said start moving into the world of trauma, we started to try it there. And that has become really, for me, another learning journey because I started to get a bifurcation in the reactivity. Some people literally gave up their anxiety. And even a dissociative person, their parts start to talk to each other and became into, I mean, it was really amazing, amazing. stories. Wow. Amazing stuff, but not universal. So you start finding these things and then you start getting what I would call counterindications. That would be high levels of reactivity and defense. And then I realized it was too fast for the nervous. This is like the EMDR bit. The nervous system had to resolve it. So we started to slow it up. And then the trauma community started to use it. And they, and, you know, trauma therapists, are a special breed with a degree of compassion and patience because many of them have trauma histories that they carry with it and they could see 
Yeah. <laughs> they can see what's going on in their client. And yeah. through the gentleness and the patience, people were going through it and resolving and having, in a sense, major changes and making them more accessible to the therapies that they are already involved in, whether it was EMDR, somatic experiencing, uh, all of them. And what they would say is that the Safe and Sound Protocol accelerated the progress, made them safe within those settings. Great. You know what, I I just love, love this, Stephen, because what this tells me is everything that I believe, which is, you know, that healing from trauma is all about attachment and connection. And if we can, you know, if we can encourage back Mm -hmm. those those social, that social attachment with, within people that have been traumatized, Mm -hmm. we are, we are facilitating a place for, for real healing to, to take place. And, and I just, yeah, it just fills me with, with so much hope just hearing you, hearing you speak like this. It's an optimistic story, an optimistic narrative. and says that if we can move our physiological state, our autonomic state out of defense, we're on our journey. Our journey is emergent. It's natural. And remember with many people who, who are survivors of trauma, they were socially social people, and then something happened. And almost at the point of the trauma, their body retuned, retuned for survival, that got stuck in that retuned survival state. And what polyvagal theory is saying, let's be optimistic. Let's mm-hmm. talk about the plasticity of the system and what it will do when it processes cues of safety. Can it, in a sense, in a sense go from here to go there? Yeah. Because in essence, the body wants to heal, doesn't it? It's it's what happens in up upstairs that often it, is. It, is it, we we have to actually uh, yes, but let's uh, let's nuance what you're saying a little bit. And the, the body yeah. is is it's really our brainstem, which is really the uh, uh, the meeting place. So it's low in our brain, and it deals with the regulation of our organs. And it's not a very complex area relative to the cortex. So it has only a few a few programs. And those programs are, you know, I'm safe. You know, I have to get the hell out of here or fight or I better disappear. Mm-hmm. You know, and these are our evolutionary. That's our evolutionary package. And this area of the brainstem, when it's safe, sends signals higher up and says, there's plenty of resource now for you to do your mental activity you can be creative you can be spiritual you can be social there's plenty of room but when we move into defense it says all processes above here have to be really biased because this is survival and in in another metaphor i would use is uh the star trek it's the energy fields get put up and it's the energy fields to protect are consuming and limiting who we are and if we in a sense peel the wrappers off of our defenses the beauty of being a human starts to express itself. But I learned about more about this from the trauma community because they are, in a sense, they still have the embedded desire and visualization of getting those wrappers off. Yeah. And I would say typicals don't even know they have wrappers. So uh, the people in the trauma community have told me so much about what they want back. They can actually articulate that. And when they describe that, you start understanding that what they want back is, in a sense, double-edged as well, because they want accessibility, which means that their body now has to be uh, able to deal with vulnerability. And at the point that they're in therapy, it has difficulty dealing with vulnerability. Yeah. Um, how do we feel, Lou, about going to some questions from from our yeah i just wanted to mention one thing yes. before we go to questions if that's all right mm-hmm. i wanted to talk about the master series coming yeah. up in three weeks time and the trauma edition which you are uh on with two other uh l- luminaries in this field um and i also wanted to share with the trauma thrivers community that if they go 
to the masterseries.com and they put in a discount code TT50. We've been very kindly offered 50% off that mm. master series, which is really great for our community and anybody mm. listening. And I really wanted to ask you, Stephen, what will you be talking about at the event? Well, I, I have the opportunity, I think, three hours or uh, to talk in which there'll be three 45 minute presentations that I'll be doing. And I will be in sense mapping out the theory and its applications. So I'll talk about the evolutionary heritage. And what we'll really be talking about actually as well is what is therapy about? It's claiming our evolutionary heritage. It's yeah. basically saying, we want to be social, we want to be connected, we want to be co-regulatory. And I'll talk about the concept that I, in well, it's a word I made up, which is called neuroception, which is our nervous system's evaluation of risk in the environment. And what that means is that it's not perception. I'm not, in a sense, identifying risk. My body is, and often I'm unaware that it is, but I have these physiological reactions. So for the in the world of trauma survivors, their neuroception is very biased to detect threat. And for uh, people who haven't experienced trauma, it's not. So the world that they experience is very different. So I'll talk about neuroception as being dependent on our physiological state. And as we shift the physiological state through strategies of triggering calmness through co-regulation and through external stimuli like the safe and sound protocol, the physiology shifts. And then the emergent properties are spontaneous social behavior. So I'll, I'll be talking about it. I'm, it's, it's, it's always, I would say, I always have kind of like a smile when, I, when I'm into these types of programs because the other participants are the people who created trauma therapy. You know, it's like, yes, uh, yes. Uh, well, of course, you're you're joined by uh, Bessel van der Kolk and Peter Levine over the yeah, three days. So right. We couldn't get three bigger masters, really. Well, we? they're, they're basically very close friends, as you would guess. You know, they're yeah, kind of like uh, brothers for me. Or, I want to be at your dinner party. <laughs> yeah, so do I. Yeah, yeah. And you're like heroes to us, I guess. So it's, yeah. Yeah. So, so it's really, you know, I always kind of like smile and say, you know, thank you for inviting me into your world. And what I do for them is I kind of, in a sense, from this neurophysiological scientific world, deconstruct what they've done. I mean, and they are both, first of all, Peter, I've known since the 1970s. So I just want you to know. So I, before there was somatic experience and I even knew Peter and he would come to visit me and start it says, downloading his ideas. Uh, and it was, it was always kind of fun. And it was this big surprise to me that it got traction and really a good big surprise yeah. uh, because you can have brilliant ideas, but to get people to come on board. Uh, it's it's harder and you know he was he was changing the model of trauma treatment Bessel is a person with a heart that never stops giving his whole goal in life is to be helpful to his clients and so he's on a quest uh, to find technologies ideas that will be helpful and we've had a wonderful relationship as well um, and so he brought me to, the, I would say, the East Coast world of trauma. And Pat Ogden brought me to the West Coast world. And yeah. Peter, I was with Peter before, uh, but uh, there's different levels of traction in different places. So it, it's been remarkable. Amazing. Both Peter and Bessel, I view as very close friends. You know, so it, it's nice to share the, the stage with them. I wish it were in person because then you would really see some interesting uh, dialogue. Like just before we go, I just wanted to ask you a last, last question from me. What now for you and where do you see trauma treatment in this field going? What's the next steps, do you think, personally oh, I, and professionally? I think it's actually moving in a nice synergistic way with greater respect for the body. And the word respect has embedded in it this ability to be a witness of others and also witness of oneself. And so we say honor your body or respect your body and self-compassion. 
there's a whole set of vectors, whether it comes from the compassion world or the somatic world or the, even the clinical world. It's all about acknowledging who you are and where you are and what has happened to you. I think the future, I actually played around with this in my talks and I used this slide, which basically says, what if Descartes were mistranslated? What if he didn't say, je pense donc, just I do it in the French, even though I used to say I speak French like an English person. So that's, uh, so, you know, <laughs> uh, I had a colleague who's from England and we used to talk French in the morning and it was, you know, it was like <laughs> ridiculous, but we, we had the same, it was the humor that we both yeah. were very poor in language. So je pense donc, je suis, I think, therefore I am. We've all heard that, whether it was in Latin or in French, but if he said, je me sens, don't just we, I feel myself using the reflexive form of the word to feel. Now, in English, we seldom distinguish between feeling an object or feeling inside our body. We use the same word. But in French, we can use the reflexive form, je me sens, I feel myself. So what if he had said that? And that's what we create our culture and society on. Je me pense, don't just we, I feel myself, therefore I am. What would Western society be like? Wow. Totally That's different. incredible. Yeah. yeah. Just to think that. Yeah. Well, meditate on that. And then yeah. you, so if you think on that and it, so you're asking, what can we get people who, who have trauma histories, who are not in therapy or are not therapists, have them sit and literally meditate on that, which is really saying, I respect what my body is saying to me. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. I just wanted to ask you that. Yeah. No, that was great. And we just, I, we sort of, I, I don't think can end this without um, asking you, Stephen, a, a slightly, um, for, for Lou and I, I think probably a, a slightly tricky question, but it's something that sort of came up in, in the Trauma Thrivers group recently um, and caused, you know, a, quite a big conversation. And this was the, um, this piece that was doing the rounds called RIP Polyvagal Theory. Yeah. Well, thank so, you, for, guess, thank yeah. you for, for asking that. It, <laughs> it, to me, it's extraordinarily interesting mm. that lack of scholarship becomes a criticism or someone's mm -hmm. lack of scholarship becomes the mo the, the initiative. Uh, there, if people can go to the Polyvagal Institute and there is a uh, online where I summarize the theory and also have responses to the criticism. Basically, the criticisms are not about polyvagal theory. They're a misreading of it and they're, it's not the theory. They're talking about uh, primitive vertebrates that occurred long before reptiles and polyvagal theory is about the transition from reptiles to mammals, the uniqueness of mammals. None of the criticisms that they cite in terms of these articles has anything to do with polyvagal theory. And it, there's a long history here and it goes back actually several decades in which I told them, the people who made the criticism, that they're not talking about the theory but they have not incorporated that. So it's just poor scholarship. And if yeah. people want to criticize it, like uh, in that uh, thing that went around, it basically talks about the premise, read the paper. The pa no premise is made without, in a sense, tens of citations of articles within various disciplines that lead to the, uh, basically the uh, statements that I was making. They're not, it says, pulled out of a hat. They're well-documented, well-researched. They can, they can say, I don't uh, accept your interpretation, but they need to come up with what is their interpretation. That's not what's going on. So you start having all these other things. And the other part is that the people who have criticized this actually in 2007 came up with what they called an alternative model uh, of how the Vegas work. And guess what? most of the points or actually every point that they made was already included in polyvagal theory. They could have said, there are points I don't agree with, but there are several points that are converging with our perspective and that's it. Instead, they said, no, I don't agree with the theory, but this is what I agree with, but they didn't see it. So in a retort, which I wrote in 2007, it's under a heading that says, uh, uh, paraphrase or something like that. It's like they, they didn't acknowledge, they just, it's just poor scholarship um, and, and poor scholarship can clearly thrive in, in social media.
you know, yeah. it becomes, quote, the big lies. Uh, my point is, it's not polyvagal theory. And I just, I try to stop it there without getting into any other level of discord. But in their articles, what they are saying that the theory states is not what the theory states. So if you have a philosophy background or a science background, these are straw men arguments where they say something that's not true and then argue why it's not true or why polyvagal theory is wrong. It's, they need to do their reading. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like to think that you you kind of know you've done something really good when someone tries to pull it down, right? That's when you I'm very human in, in a sense that I do not like um, certain types of uh, criticisms. I don't mind mm-hmm. criticisms that are based on something because we learn from it. It informs yeah. us, you, re- you correct but there are ways in which one criticizes, like that little piece said it was wrong, but nothing that that piece said that was wrong can be substantiated. And even even if all those points were wrong, it has no impact on the clinical application of the theory because it didn't talk about the extracted principles that the community is using. So, you know, so I, when people say it's wrong, I say, can evolution be wrong? Can dissolution be wrong? Can the neural, you know, what are you talking about? And the issue is people need, people get upset when they're not cited or when their work is criticized and they react in a very, let's say reptilian way. And interestingly, that that anger and that reactivity limits their ability to even do understanding. So the so the woman who wrote that doesn't bother me. What bothers me is the citations that she used to support that argument because they're wrong. They're just misrepresentation of theory. Now she's in a community that is not a scientific community, and because someone says on uh, social media that three or four scientists disagree. Look at Google Scholar and look at the tens of thousands of peer reviewed articles uh, that have cited polyvagal theory as support for their research. Yeah. And also work with, as a a therapist, work with your clients on what they feel is useful and really helpful and a theory that's impacted not only them, but your own understanding of neurophysiology as a therapist. Yeah. It's like looking at the evidence of us, isn't it? Of how helpful, yeah. I mean, I can't think of a world before polyvagal theory. I was trying to think the other day, mm-hmm. what what did I do before, before I knew about this? Did I just teach people about the brain? What, what yeah. Do you know what I mean? Well, I think, you know, Lou, you're, you're, you're right. Before polyvagal theory, the interest in neuroscience was basically uh, uh, disparate. It was separated from the clinical activity. And yeah. polyvagal theory was really a, not merely a science of safety, it was a science of feelings. And that then could relate to the clinician. I, I like to use what Peter Levine says. He says it's a map. You know, yeah. polyvagal theory gives us a map. And the yeah. map becomes useful. It doesn't give us all the answers, but it gives us a map to work with and we can do discovery with it. And we, and the theory can evolve. So when people criticize, I want the criticisms to have a degree of validity so the theory can be challenged appropriately, can expand or be modified. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for answering that. Mel, have we got any questions? We've got quite a few, but I'm quite aware of time that we're coming up to to having already taken an hour of of Stephen's of Stephen's precious time and we know that he has some uh, some important plans this afternoon so I think uh, just from reading through them I do think that that as we've gone along Stephen has mm. sort of answered quite a lot of them I just wanted to read this one out from Morven because actually it's something that I'm sort of interested in me right? it sparked something in me when I read it Um, And she said, um, also, when working with clients, is it good to educate them about the people around them also being traumatized and acting in a dysfunctional way towards the client? Do we think that that would help Hmm. with engaging a sense of safety? I think it helps change the narrative. Hmm. So when people assume validity in, uh, in, in the actions of others towards them, they start 
taking on shame and blame in others. But if we start seeing the world as really a traumatized world, that we need to literally step back and have compassion, even for those who are critical of us, and have an understanding of what's happening inside their bodies that make them. So like the criticism, what's making people so hostile about something that is really uh, about making life better for others. So you have to think about that and say, what, it, what are people trying to do? Why are they doing this? And what is their narrative? And you know, we start understanding a lot about people and a lot of people don't want to disappear. So that, meaning that uh, dissociative feelings, if you don't have boundary, if you don't have recognition, if you don't have stuff, make people feel like they're going to dissolve. It's like in the Wizard of Oz, you know, it's like the Wicked Witch just dissolves. And we have to understand that our boundaries, uh, when we are really safe, our boundaries are both porous and expansive. So we allow people in and we reach out and we gain through giving and we gain through our altruism, our passion and compassion and we're because we're not threatened we're not asking what do i get for this we're smiling when what we do is helpful to others and when you ask uh, when you start in sense educating your clients and saying that they're in a world in which many people don't have those views they start in a sense understanding the intentionality of other and it it you know as opposed to assuming that there's validity in that intentionality. Yeah, absolutely. And if I could just one more, again, very interesting question. Um, Dan has asked, um, curious about your thoughts on vagal states and language processing. And he's just gone on to sort of explain. He said, it seems to me that there is a neurobiology that corresponds to the saying, you can take a horse to water, but not make it drink. Um, and then he talks about... Um, the um, prosody that has an inverse effect for people who don't want to hear it, for example, people like Eckhart Tolle. Um, and he's, he ends saying this is why we have to emotionally and spiritually code switch when talking about ineffable things. So I think the question yeah. is basically, yeah, what, what, is your, what are your thoughts around that? that that's a complicated type of my thoughts. So yeah. what he's really saying don't allow, don't be porous or acceptable or um, accessible when the ethics or the thoughts are negative. And I, I tend to agree with this. I try to navigate in a world that has minimal negativity. It's not easy. So like bringing up the criticism, that was negativity in my world. And part of me was, I just didn't even want to deal with it. Let it just go. But I had a community to deal with because they were can't answer the question. So I had to quote as his question, I had to turn off my affective state and become, in a sense, a, a scholar to, in a sense, go in without the emotion and try to find out really what were these people trying to say. And it wasn't an easy task. So I had to, I had a state shift just like he's describing, if I need, I, I talk about different hats. And I often say that if you want the hat of the scientist, if you want me to be the scientist, you better be careful. You know, the, the, cause the, uh, the critical, uh, slightly caustic, you know, it, it might come out because I am delving into a different level of problems, but it's not my persona. My persona is at the core is to be accessible and interact with people. But if my task is to figure something out, I'm, I'm a different person. And so I think we do a lot of it said, switching of parts or limitation of who we are. Uh, to, but we need to be aware that we're doing it and we have to understand why we're doing it. And so if we are dealing like with an ethical issue or how much of uh, news can you watch with pandemics and with weather patterns and with politics in the U.S., uh, there's just so much you can handle because it is a pervasive uh, matrix of threat. And this is really changing my physiology. And what that means, it's biasing my neuroception towards greater negativity. And if I get switched into negativity, who am I? I you know, I'm someone different. 
as well as so are most other people. Mm -hmm. But I can see this happening with like with the masking, uh, people feeling that they have the right not to wear masks. You don't have the right to injure others. And they don't have that perspective because they are already in that state. And so I can see it to understand. So going back to your real question before, your first question before you got Dan's comment is we need to be aware of the position and the state of others, but we also have to understand that if we are moving into the realm of problem solving, we might ha we may give up our connectivity with others to solve the problem. But there's a difference between chronic state and acute state. So I can move into a state and work for several hours and write or do these things. But once I stand up or walk out of the office, I can become the other person or it can become a person. But I think this awareness of ourselves is really, a, we need to become more aware of it is what I'm saying. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. I think we, we do have more, but I think I think most of them have been answered. I'll, I'll have a look back through after when, when we come off and and if um, yeah, if there's anything there that that I think hasn't been answered, we'll Lou and I will do our best. <laughs> we will. We will indeed. And in the meantime, just thank you so much for yeah. joining us. Really, really very honoured and privileged and lovely to meet you. And really looking forward to the master series. Can't mm. wait for that too. Mm. And hopefully one day, maybe in the UK, if you're ever allowed over again, I don't know, we're ever allowed over there. Yeah, you know, it's, it's strange times. Um, yeah. I have optimistic perspective and I appreciate the interactions and the, in the uh, connection with others, even if it's just through a virtual world. So thank you for inviting me onto your your platform, and I hope to really see you sometime in the future. Yeah, I'll love to. Thanks, Stephen. Thank I'll you so much, Stephen. Thank you. Yeah. Take You're care. Okay. Bye bye. 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 bye.